Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel. Glad you're here this morning. As you know, we've been having some record heat, so hopefully it will die down while we're here this morning. So, wasn't that great worship? Hallelujah. <laughs> now, that's old school stuff, by the way. Yeah. That's the stuff that I grew up on when I got saved back in the, in the 80s. Um, so some of you are like, yeah, I remember that. Now you're, you're, you're dating yourself. And the others are like, where did those songs come from? <laughs> Man, those, that's, I love Rudy. Thank you, Rudy, for coming out, bringing your lovely wife uh, and blessing us today. Um, I just, <clears throat> man, brings back a lot of memories, a lot of memories, revival in the church and yeah. a time where people were really on fire for the Lord. And I just hope that, that that just comes back to the church today as we're living in the last days that revival will take place in each one of our hearts, that nothing else matters but the Lord and, and what the Lord is doing. Amen? Amen. Amen? If you have a bulletin, let's open it up. If you don't, raise your hand and they will get you one. We have quite a few announcements again as we're drawing closer to the end of summer. Things are starting to happen in the church. So today we will be in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 10 through 16. So if you want to turn your Bibles there. Um, Wednesday nights, we do have a Bible study. And where you go through the Old Testament. I want to encourage you to prayerfully think and pray that you would join us on Wednesday nights. Again, old school. Uh, back in the days, Wednesday nights were the night that you get that midweek service, you get the word, it just pumps you up to get you through the rest of the week. And it used to be a time where the church would really gather together. And as many that gathered on Sunday, they'd gather on Wednesday also. But we've seen a, a great decline in that uh, for whatever reason uh, in the time that we're living in. And I just hope that, <clears throat> that you'll make time for the Lord and come on out and join us as we go through the Old Testament. Oftentimes, as we're reading through the Bible, we're reading through the New Testament, but not necessarily the Old. And the Old is a little more difficult to, to understand if you don't actually do some studying. And so it's good to come on out and, and get a fresh look at the Old Testament and what is going on there. And we're actually in the book of Numbers. We'll be in chapter uh, 11 this coming Wednesday. So if you'd like to join us. I know some churches have home studies, and that's a big thing right now, home studies, and they don't have a midweek service there's a home study going on within the church in various homes. And that's another way of, of getting that fellowship and also get going through the Word. If you look in the center column there, I have a short missions trip. Um, I'm not going to say where I'm going, but you know where I'm going because we're on Facebook Live. And I, I don't want to give it away for whatever reasons, security, safety, and for all people that are over there. But I need your support. We have raised about half of the amount. We need about $4,000 uh, to go. And about half of it is raised. And so I need to raise the, the rest of it. So pray about it and see if that's what the Lord is leading you to do to support that work as I go out and minister to probably over 100 leaders uh, within this area. Um, it will be October 12th. Through the 25th, I'll be taking off from LAX and, and heading uh, out to Europe area. So, uh, and if you have questions, please come see me afterwards and I'll give you more details. But I'm going to be pouring into then the inductive Bible study, how to study the Bible, how to get a lot out of it, especially when you don't have all the resources available uh, to you uh, because of the, where you're at. So. So pray about that and seek the Lord. And if the Lord is nudging your heart to support that in whatever amount, support it. It's like you are going out there because you're supporting the work that's and the right. work that's out there. So it's very important that we do that. Youth night, August 2nd, 7 p.m. here at the church, 6.30 uh, here at the church. Uh, all youth are invited. All youth invite your friends. Come on out and have a great time as Carlos uh, leads them in worship and also discipleship study. The third is a beach bash. So everyone is invited. All the youth are going out there early in the morning. You can see Carlos for details. He'll let you know what lifeguard station they'll be at. It's a, a neat time of just fellowship and enjoying the water, the waves. Um, they're going to have a, a pit, barbecue, and it's going to be from morning until evening, somewhere around 10 o'clock from what I hear. Too, too late for me. That would be embedded at, at 8. So... 
discipleship meeting um, is August 6, 6.30 here at the church on Tuesday. What is discipleship meeting? It's where we gather together and just answer questions. We, we sit up the tables here and everyone is welcome to join us and I just sit there and shoot, ask me a question and we'll talk about the Bible, we'll talk about the question, we'll talk on any subject and if everyone's quiet, which is usually the case because no one wants to ask a question, but they come out, I'll, I'll have a subject, the Lord sometimes lays something on my heart. But we'll talk about anything. It's a neat time to spend time with me, spend time in fellowship, spend time being discipled for the ministry. You know, why do we do the things that we do at church? You know, why is it that we do that over there? And where did that come from? Those kind of questions that you might have. That's the place in the venue to ask them and not, you know, keep them within yourself or be talking with other people about them. Just ask straight up to the leadership. So that'd be August 3rd. I'm sorry, August 6th. Jesus Virtual Reality, I mentioned it last week. The sign-up sheet is in the uh, courtyard area. There's a table with three sign-up sheets. You'll have the virtual reality. We still need some people. Uh, I mentioned it last week, but we didn't put the sign-up sheet out there. Maybe you wanted to sign up and you couldn't find it. So please go to the courtyard. You'll see a table there with sign-up sheets and sign up for the virtual reality so we can get those guys out here and, and enjoy the, the whole scene of watching Jesus. Uh, from a, not a, it's not a 3D, but from a virtual reality perspective. So, uh, Continue to pray for those three people in your life that the Lord would, would uh, draw them to himself. Now, uh, two blessings. Uh, somebody was sharing with me just the other day that uh, through this prayer, the Lord has answered a prayer and communication with somebody. So it's working. Someone else was saying that they were praying for three people and they actually came to church. So it's working. So let's keep doing that and praying and asking God to give us that opportunity. The men's retreat, which is October 4th through the 6th, cost is $125. We have nine guys signed up, so we have six spots left. But we need the $25 deposit by next Sunday. So please sign up. That's also in the courtyard. And go online and pay your deposit or write a check and make sure you put men's retreat on the bottom so it goes towards uh, your... Um, Payment. Uh, the payment is in three portions, $25 deposit, non-refundable, and then 50 and 50 before the event. Now, if you don't pay your deposit, and then someone else is in line to come, because we only have 16 to 20 spots, uh, and possibly only 16, it just all depends if we can sneak the other four in somehow, because I'm going to kind of come in and then I'll be leaving to be here Sunday, so... Uh, but if you don't pay that deposit and someone else comes in, we're going to give them your spot if they pay that deposit. So please pay the deposit so we reserve your spot for you. All right, let's have the ushers come forward. Um, there's a worship conference coming up September 5th. So all those of you in sound and in worship and are interested in worship, pray about going to this conference. Uh, I'll have these cards out in the foyer area along with the sign-up sheet. Randy can put a bunch of those out there so you can pick them up. A couple more things that my wife wanted me to mention. The, uh, the night of glowing in the dark is today at uh, 6 p.m. to 10. The cost is $5. If you don't have a, any children, you'd like to just come out and help her, she would appreciate that uh, today. Um, if you have been to my wife's events, they are pretty spectacular. She does a great job with the kids. So if you're interested, see her afterwards or, or Deborah. Also, October, I'm sorry, September, August 15th, and it will finish September 12th. She is hosting a summer discipleship class here at the church on Thursday nights. The flyers are in the foyer area. The cost is $10. So if you'd like to sign up and, and have a summer study, it's here for the ladies. All right, let's pray. Hope I got everything. Oh, gracious Lord, thank you, Father, for this opportunity now, Lord, where we open up your word. And this is really why we came, Lord, to truly understand uh, your word, Lord. It helps us to understand who you are and what you ask of us, Lord. Not out of constraint, Lord, or law, Lord, but out of love. Because your love, Lord, for us is so great that you have set up these safeguards for us to follow so it keeps us from harm, keeps us from pain and suffering. The consequences that 
that people suffer are oftentimes the fact that they're not being obedient to the word of God. And Lord, your word is powerful and it keeps us in peace and in harmony, Lord. And we're just praying that you would minister to us today, Lord. And Lord, as your word says, that you'll bless those who support your work, Lord. Malachi is very clear that he'll open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that which you cannot contain. And that truth is still good for today because Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, no, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Lord, that if you sow sparingly, you'll reap sparingly. But if you sow abundantly, giving a lot, then God says he will give back to you abundantly. And so, Lord, I pray your blessings upon those who support this church, that it may continue to go forth and be a light in this community. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray all these things. And we all agree and say, Amen. 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 Good morning, everyone out in the courtyard. We're glad that you're here with us today. We will be in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and we will be looking at verses 10 through 16. 10 through 16, so if you want to open up your Bible. Now, I know we have new people here today, and you can't miss them, <laughs> a small church. And so I want to explain something before we get started. I am a pastor, which means that I tend God's children, of the flock. I try to bring comfort and, and mercy and grace to them. That is my heart, is that they would come to know Jesus Christ more <clears throat> deeply and put their <clears throat> face and dependency on Jesus alone and hoping that their faith in Him would continue to grow deep. That is my heart as a pastor, and I come alongside them like a shepherd to a sheep to help them uh, do that. I'm also, though, a teacher, and a teacher is not an evangelist. A teacher is just a teacher. He teaches the Bible, and God has given me a unique gift to teach just the Bible. And he's given me that gift because I don't know how to do anything other than that. <laughs> I'm not very charismatic. I don't tell jokes very well. Um, I'm not a storyteller. So I just stick with the text. And I think that's rare to find today that where you just get the text. Unless you go to a university and sit under a professor and they dissect each statement within the Bible, which then you're studying to become a theologian. And so basically, uh, you are all studying to become theologians as I'm kind of like the professor teaching you even through the Greek language, which you know I have been getting uh, more involved in so that we get a clear understanding of the text. And so God believes and knows that you are all capable of becoming theologians because he has sent you here to sit under me to teach you just the word of God. So don't, under, don't underestimate your knowledge and your ability because you're all smart people and you're going to get it and you're going to be well trained in scripture more than if you went to a church and you heard a lot of funny stories. You know? uh, you're going to hear the word today. So saying that now, <clears throat> we're going to get into our study. We've been doing a series on biblical relationships and today will be the fourth part. We will not be done with it, but it's the fourth part. Today we will be dealing with something that is very personal and very dear to my heart. Uh, I struggled as I went through this because I know myself. I know the tendencies that I have because of the place where I came from, from my parents. And so I'm going to share with you a story, and it's not to get you emotional it's not to uh, move you in any direction. It's just my story and why this has affected me the way that it affects me when I read this. See, I come from a family that was dysfunctional. Yeah, I know, we're all dysfunctional, <laughs> right, from time to time. My father, who uh, ran away from home at the age of 13, pretty much lived out in the world. Uh, he met my wife at the age of 18, 19, and got married at 21. So they were married very young. Your mother. Hmm? Your mother. My mother. I'm sorry. What did I say? Well, oh, my wife. Oh, my wife. No, my wife. That's dysfunctional. That, that's <laughs> here's, what's, here's what's really funny. When I took my mom to the hospital last night, and as we're in the hospital, the nurse came in, and, and he looked at both of us, and he said to, 
to, to my wife, so who is this person? How are they related to you? And I'm like, what do you say? <laughs> you know? I mean, we live in that day and culture now that an older woman can be with a younger man, right? That they have to ask questions. I'm like, I'm her son. That's who I am. <laughs> and it just felt so strange to hear that. So Freudian slip there. Um, so my father had a rough life. My mother had a rough life. Also didn't graduate uh, even junior high young. And earlier in my life as a young man, my three other siblings, uh, we experienced my father leaving my mother. <clears throat> they never got divorced, but he left. Left her for alcohol, left her for another woman, women. Uh, had a, a, another son, so we have a stepbrother that's out there. Never divorced, though. Stayed married and was committed, and then eventually uh, the Lord uh, took him, uh, his life. Whether he's in heaven or not, I'm not sure. Uh, that's up to the Lord. Um, he would not receive Jesus Christ. But he separated himself from my mother for many years of our childhood. And it was devastating to us. It was very devastating. And I say this with grace and not to shame anyone. Uh, my, two of my family members uh, had tried to commit suicide because of the way that it affected us. And I know that divorce, separation affects us deeply. And it stays with us for many, many years. And so the challenge in this scripture here is to hear what the Lord is saying about separation, divorce, and how critical it is for us to do everything that is possible to love our spouses, to stick with our spouses, and see it out to the very, very end. Because it's not only about you and your spouse. There are other people that are involved in that, even if your children are of older age. And I know it's so prevalent today to get divorced, to separate. It's almost like a clockwork. You know, people are doing it all the time and having two or three different spouses uh, from here and there. And so there's a, a numbness that's there. But it was very real back then, just as it's real today. Nothing has changed. And so it's devastating. I get that. And some of us might be a product, byproducts of the divorce. And Paul wants to touch on divorce and give instruction on how to minimize that pain and the consequences of divorce. So he instructs on proper separation for couples, remarriage and marriage to unbelievers because they were dealing with Corinthians who were married to unbelievers and believers together. And so we're going to continue on in verses 1 through 24, actually 1 through 40. It's a slow process, I know. But I felt that this was important in our day and age today. And we're going to talk about this today. And next week we'll get into uh, some other instructions about being content in life, and then talk again once about single and also dealing with widows. Three points this morning. Departing from your spouse or divorcing your spouse. A, and then second point, a non-believing spouse. So he's going to deal with those who are married to a person that is not a believer in Christ, who's not born again. And then also non-believers that depart. So those non-believers who decide... <coughs> I don't want to be a part of your Christianity or in this relationship, and so they want to divorce in America. So let's read the context here so we get it. Let's look at verse 10 through 16. Paul writes, Now to the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord. A wife is not to depart from her husband, but even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And a husband is not to divorce his wife, but to the rest I, not the Lord, say... If any brother has a wife who does not believe and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. But if the unbelieving departs, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases. But God has called us to peace. For now, or for how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? First point, departing from your spouse. Verse 10, Paul makes it very clear as he's writing to the Corinthians and answering their questions. You know, to the married, he commands... Yet not I, but the Lord, a wife is not to depart from her husband. 
Now, Jesus said the same thing, and Paul heard Jesus say these things. This is why I believe that Paul was among some of the Pharisees that were testing Jesus in the beginning. Uh, he heard the sayings of Jesus. He probably saw Jesus performing miracles and so forth, which he also had a hatred to Jesus. But the words were resounding. They penetrated into heart, Paul's heart. And once he became a Christian, they became a part of him. And so in these scriptures, you can actually hear some of the words of Jesus Christ also talking. And Jesus said in Matthew 5.32, I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife except on the grounds of sexual immorality. So the only grounds of divorce is sexual immorality. If there's infidelity, if there's unfaithfulness or adultery, then you have not a right, but you have the privilege of choosing to divorce and leave that situation. It says, make her commit, it says, but if it's not on the ground of sexuality, you're making her commit adultery. And, what, and, and whoever marries a divorced woman also commits adultery. So if there's no grounds for divorce and you divorce your wife, then both of you may be committing adultery when you get into another relationship. That needs to be considered. You need to think about this. I know it doesn't make sense to us because that is so foreign from us to, to say to us that we're committing adultery if we divorce our wife when legally we're divorced, but not in the eyes of God. And that is more important than the eyes of the government or our laws of the land. God's laws are higher above those laws. And so in his eyes, uh, we are not divorced if we do it from a non-biblical perspective. Malachi also says in 2, 14 through 16, in the Old Testament, they dealt with it too. Uh, we don't even see it in, in some of the Old Testament books when when the children of Israel were commingling with the culture. And, and God had to deal with that and, and cause them to separate from those things. But in Malachi, and this is a good book, which is the last book of the Old Testament, it says, The Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. How important is that? You've made a covenant. you made a vow to stick for better or for worse. It's a covenant, and she's been the wife of your youth. Did he not make them one? See, that's the spiritual aspect of it. When you become one spiritually and, and physically as a couple, when you consummate that marriage, there's something special that takes place there. And he said, did you not become one with a portion of the Spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. What's the purpose of marriage? To have godly offspring. So guard yourselves in your spirit and let none of you be faithless to your wife of your youth. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourselves in your spirit and do not be faithless. Jeremiah 3.20 also says, Surely as a treacherous wife leaves her husband, so have you been treacherous to me, O house of Israel, declares the Lord. <clears throat> our relationship does not only speak about our relationship as a husband and wife. Our relationships speak about our relationship with God. It's a spiritual relationship. Jesus is married to the church. And the way that we treat one another as spouses is the way that we treat the Lord. And so we're representing God. Paul said it in Ephesians later on that it's a mystery, but marriage speaks of Christ and the church. And sometimes we don't think about that responsibility. What we have as Christian believers to the world, light and salt, that we have a responsibility to reflect the marriage between Christ and the church. And so there's more at stake than just us. Though I understand the feelings and the emotions that get involved, the, the detachment that begins when you start looking for faults to justify why you want to leave and so forth, but yet we're not to live by sight, but by faith in God and not by what we see. Now let me read to you uh, my amplified paraphrase as Paul is speaking to the married and he's referencing Jesus. So verse 10 reads like this. But to those who are or getting married, I, Paul, personally continually give, continually is the emphasis there. So what Paul is saying is, look, I'm not going to change my mind here. This is the truth, and it's not going to change just because you want it to change. 
And that is how the Word of God is, right? Jesus said, I'm the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He doesn't change. His love for you yesterday was just the same as today, and it will be tomorrow. No matter what you do, no matter how bad you get, <clears throat> no matter how good you are, you can increase on that love. It is the same today, yes, to, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So God does not change. And Paul is saying here, this doesn't change. These guidelines and these instructions do not change. They are continual. Now remember that in this chapter, Paul is answering questions written to him from the Corinthian uh, church there. And he had already dealt with the question about being married or single. And if it is more spiritual to abstain from sex in a marriage relationship, then they were willing to get a divorce if it made them more spiritual. And now the text indicates he is moving to another question. And these questions and answers have to do with marriage and divorce. And here Paul is addressing marriage when both partners are believers in Christ Jesus. So he says that the wife, when tempted, should not divorce the husband. Now there are outside sources that are trying to tempt us constantly. We know that in our relationships. There are billboards, there's ads, there's people that we look, maybe look up to as, as secular world and entertainment and so forth. And these things are temptations, they're attacks. Or whether they're attacks from outside of your relations. They could be friends. How many times have we heard stories about friends getting involved and so forth? Now, personally, <clears throat> my wife and I, and this is our choice, and it's something that has guarded us to a certain degree, hasn't been you know, clad in, in the sense, but it has helped us. We don't really have a whole lot of friends that we hang around with. Uh, she doesn't really have a friend or a best friend. She has the body of Christ and the ladies that are here, but she doesn't have a friend that she goes over to her house and they sit down and have a cup of coffee and they talk with each other. How many times... Has that disrupted your relationships when you start talking about your husbands and then you get this worldly advice, you know, and it leads to, well, you need to leave him because he's a jerk, you know, type of thing. And or guys going with other guys and talking about their wives and saying, you need to leave her, you know, because she's a jerk, you know, and so forth. So we have chosen not to necessarily have those kind of friends that we can go to. We go to the Lord or we go to one another or we don't go to one another and we just go to the Lord and we pray to him. And it guards us from that temptation because that's an outside source that tries to come in and cause havoc with our relationship. And that's what Paul's saying here is that your wife will be tempted from outside. And by the way, the same is true of husband. But verse 11, he goes on, but even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And a husband is not to divorce his wife. So when a husband accuses his wife of unfaithfulness, and we see this in the Old Testament, there was actually a formula that you were to apply to see if she was unfaithful. In Deuteronomy 22, 19, it says, they shall uh, find him a hundred shekels of silver and give them to the father of the young woman because he has brought a bad name upon a virgin in Israel and she shall be his wife. He may not divorce her all of his days. There were accusations back then, jealousy in other words, and there's some men that are very jealous. They don't trust their wives, and so they're constantly keeping an eye on them. Uh, and they're always thinking that they're going to cheat on them. And so that happened back in Israel. And if somebody, a husband, accused their wife, there was a form that they would perform. And then if they found out that that was not true, then he actually had to pay a fine. And now you're stuck for the rest of your life. You can never divorce her because of your accusations. Now, you're stuck anyway, right? Because that's the vow and the covenant, so it doesn't matter. But just a reminder, remember, you, you made a covenant forever for worse and for eternity until you go to heaven. And so now I'm just amplifying that and saying, now because of the accusations, remember, you're stuck forever. So don't even think about leaving, in other words. In my Amplified, it says, but in, in case she does divorce because of outside pressure the passive voice there in the Greek. So if that outside pressure gets to her and she decides to uh, get a divorce, a Christian couple may, in fact, split up for reasons that do not justify biblical divorce. It happens. Mm -hmm. There are people that split up. <clears throat> there are people, and I know, I know of them, that are married, but they sleep in separate rooms for whatever reasons. Uh, it could be difficulties, there are differences, it's just too much. You know, no one knows who the head of the home is. It's, it's a struggle. Maybe they do know who the head of the home is and they don't care. You know, there's all kinds of various reasons. So they live a separate life. 
That happens. And what Paul is saying here is that if you live that separate life, you can't get remarried. You stay as though you were single. And Paul recognizes that. She must remain continually single, continually, he said. So there's no buts, ifs, or ands about it. You cannot get married. You have to stay single. And Paul adds, which is possible with God. You can do it with God's strength in that situation. <clears throat> or it says, or else be reconciled, finding favor or grace with her husband, which is possible with God, and that the husband should choose not to let go continually his wife. So it's true in both cases. You are not to divorce. But if you separate, you cannot get remarried or you cannot go to <laughs> Now, why is he dealing with this? Because the Corinthians were dealing with this in the church. And we see it happening today. And so he's trying to get us to understand that our marriage is more important than anything in our lives. It represents Christ and the church. And it also may affect our children and how they view marriage later on down the future. And oftentimes, and you'll see that if there's divorce in a family, oftentimes the children will also uh, be byproducts of that divorce and get divorces themselves. Second point, what about non-believing spouses? Now, it seemed that there were believers married to unbelievers. We see that today. And by the way, God has already told us in Corinthians that we should not do that. So as believers, we need to marry believers. And we need to marry strong believers. We need to marry people of the opposite sex that are so much more in love with God than they are with you. That's important. Do not be unequally yoked. Do not be unequally yoked, the Bible says. And that spans every part of life. That spans with business. Don't be unequally yoked with people that are not believers. You might think you know better than God, but it's going to lead you to trouble. It will lead you to trouble. I've seen it over and over again. Remember my wife and I, when we were younger in the Lord, uh, we had a situation where a family member was going to get married to a non-believer. And so we brought up that, I brought up that scripture to my wife, and she says, no, that's not what God is saying. That's not a commandment. I go, yes, that's a commandment. God is telling us as believers we're not to be unequally yoked with non-believers. And she wouldn't, she wouldn't receive it. Of course, at that time, I was very forceful. And I kept bringing it up, kept bringing it up. And finally, she just had it with me. And, and she said, don't talk to me about it anymore. And so I did it. But then eventually, the Lord just ministered to her and, and brought to her the revelation of the truth of that scripture. And exactly what the Bible warned against is what happened with that family member. So <clears throat> we need to be careful because it brings in uh, great damage and heartache and pain. So Paul is talking about a believer who's married to an unbeliever. And so they asked if they had to stay married in that situation, which makes sense, right? If I'm, now that I'm a Christian, now that I'm a believer and my spouse is an unbeliever, maybe now I have the right to leave them. Or maybe they have the right to leave me. So they're asking this question, and Paul answers, verse 12, To the rest, I, not the Lord, says, If a brother has a wife who does not believe, and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce. So he's changing directions to that unbelieving spouse. And Paul is exhorting or giving advice here that you are to continually heed my advice as I give it to you. The question was asked, Often about this verse here in itself, this Paul is saying here, not I but the Lord is saying these inspired words. And the answer is yes, these are inspired words of God. The scriptures are clear. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And, and sometimes some, someone will look at the scripture and look at Paul is saying that not God or not the Lord, but I'm saying this. But it's in the Bible. And all scripture is inspired. So even though Paul felt like this is my opinion, still God put it in the Bible and it became inspired by God, even though Paul felt it was his opinion. That's what I believe. So he's saying that if any brother has continually a wife who is an unbeliever, now continually an unbeliever, this is how she lives her life. She lives it without God. She doesn't trust or put faith in God. She's not born again. She's not interested in the things from above. She's more interested about Earthly things, you know what that means. People that are not interested in church. People who are not interested in spiritual things. People that are not interested in church functions and so forth. People that are not interested in Wednesday nights. I'm not saying that to you. <laughs> to accuse you of anything. But if the Lord is ministering to you, because we're born from above. 
And so our mindset changes, our focus changes, our direction changes. That's what happens naturally. Let me give you an example of that. Look at the Apostle Paul. He was persecuting the church. He was gathering them up to put them into prison. And all of a sudden he encounters the light, the great light. Now, did he continue to persecute? Did he continue to chase after the church? Put them in? No. What happened? He changed directions. He now joined the church. He now participated in church. He now was a part of the church. And then he began to use the gifts that God had given him for the church. That's a person that has been changed, born again, that's seeking the things above. And I can go story after story <clears throat> with Timothy, with Luke, <clears throat> with the disciples. You look at their old life <clears throat> and how timid they were, how confused they were. And then after that anointing in the upper room, boom, boy, were they changed to a new life. And so we have biblical evidence that when you become a believer, you become born again, your life should change. Your desires should change. Your hungers should Amen. change. That's the truth. That's how you know that you are a believer because your life changes. Now, a person that is worried about their salvation, you know, they, they sometimes come to me and say, I'm not sure if I'm saved. I keep sinning, keep falling short, and I'm not sure if I'm saved. By the very fact that you're concerned about not being saved is evidence that you are saved. Because in the old man, you wouldn't care. You wouldn't even think about it. So the fact that you're asking the questions is evidence that you're saved. Because you're seeking the things above. You want to be saved. You want to make sure that you're saved. And so you're asking these questions. So really, the struggle is about the old man and the old flesh and the battle between them two that you are enduring, which we have with us always. I still battle with the flesh. How many of you still battle with the flesh? Yeah. We all do, right? So there's grace. And there's mercy in God, and we just continue to seek above and feed that old flesh less and less. So if, if she continually consents to live continually with him, and that is that she's in love, right? She's not a believer, but yes, she's in love with the guy, and she cares about him deeply, and she has no plans on leaving. She wants to stay with him, and there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. I'm not even thinking about it. Then let her stay. If it's possible, let her stay. And that's a good thing. Now, I knew a friend of mine that, that was in this situation, and she was an unbeliever, but she didn't want to leave. And he constantly prayed. We prayed. He would tell me about it, and he asked me to pray for her, and we, we prayed many, many, many times. I'm not going to tell you the whole story, but something happened in her life which caused her to see her sinfulness. She repented, and she became a believer. Now, this is after 25 years of living with her. And they lived separate lives. She did her thing in the world, and he did his thing in church. He was always in church. He was, always, he was a part of the worship team. He was a part of, of men's ministries, going out, sharing the gospel with people. They were very much separate lives, but they chose to stick it out together. And it paid off, because in the end, the Lord opened her eyes, and now they do ministry together. So it's possible. Don't lose hope. Continue to pray and seek the Lord. Now, Paul goes on in verse 13, and uh, and a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. So the same is true for a non-believing husband, right? In both cases. Now I find this interesting, just a, just a side note. Notice how Paul is dealing with both male and female here, which is strange for the custom back then because females were not highly esteemed. That's right. So it's pretty interesting how Paul is, is lifting up women at that time. And for us today, where women are really lifted up so much so above men today, and the challenge is them coming down and submitting to their husbands, that's really the challenge, and letting them be the leader today, it's interesting how Paul is now showing women where their place really is with the Lord and with their spouses. But he goes on, he says in verse 14, For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but, not, <clears throat> but now are holy. What Paul is saying here is very clear. <clears throat> Look, because there's a believer in the family, <clears throat> God's blessings will be upon you. Not salvation, because if it was salvation, <clears throat> Paul would never have called them an unbeliever. So it has nothing to do with salvation. These are unbelievers. They're not going to heaven, unfortunately, but they're going to enjoy the blessings because of the spouse that is a believer. And the children's will be set apart for God also because of the believing spouse. 
So that's important to understand and know and be confident that your faith and your trust in God will overflow to your unbelieving family. You'll sanctify them. And he goes on in verse 15, but if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such a case, but God has called us to peace. Now this is an interesting verse here. Because if an unbeliever decides to leave, Paul is saying, let him leave. Let me read it to you in my Amplified. If the unbeliever who doesn't trust in God divorces continually, so in other words, it's final, let them divorce continue. Let it be final. And he emphasizes that. The brother or sister is not a bound man. In other words, like a bond servant, where they freely have to choose to stay with them. They don't, is what he's saying. Or the sister is not a bound man to him in such cases, but God has completely called continually us to peace or harmony in our relationships. So if there is a non-believer and that non-believer says, that's it, I can't, I can't take a Christianity, I can't take your, you know, praise God, praise the Lord all the time, you know, you're just pushing, 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 that's it, I've had it, I'm leaving. Now, if you can, I believe that God's heart, because Jesus never said, <clears throat> you know, when, when he said that unless there's sexual immorality, he didn't say you have a right to divorce. He says you can choose to divorce. He never said you had a right to. So it's a choice. I believe, personally, that if there is immorality in a relationship, I think God gets greater glory when you can forgive one another and you can work through it. I know that that's hard for some people. But I think that's God's heart because God would never divorce us. We are His until the very end. To the very end. So in this case, I think that if a non-believer wanted to leave, I think that you should try as much as possible to keep them. Because by your witness, uh, by your example of love and mercy, not by cramming the Bible and putting scripture notes in their sandwich when they eat it, you know, and all of a sudden they're like, oh, here she goes again, you know, that kind of stuff, you know, but truly, truly being a woman like Sarah, Abraham's wife, and being that example of love and grace and mercy, they'll turn, they'll turn to the Lord, and that's what Paul's point is here. Let me close in verse 16 as he asks two questions here. For how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? See, Paul is saying, look, there has to be peace in your relationship. If there's no peace, and it's constant turmoil, then let them leave because God wants you to be at peace continually. God wants us to have peace. Peace is important in our lives. Rest. He doesn't like the turmoil. The turmoil and all that stuff comes when we try to control things in our own strength, when we need to just leave it to the Lord Trust in Him that He can work it through. And it gives us such a peace because God is doing the work and not us. But if that can't happen, then it's time to maybe let them go. Because we don't know if we can save them or not. And that's the question that people should be asking before they get married, not after they get married. Right? If he's not a believer and I'm thinking get married, how am I going to change him? I can't because I can't change him. There's no way I can change him. Only God can change him, so I better think twice before getting married to this person. They should be asking that before, not afterwards. But he's making a good point. Look, you can't change their heart. That's God's department. We're to be light and salt and reflect Christ, and that's it. So let me close with this, and I think this is important because this kind of summarizes really the heart of God and the heart of the Apostle Paul on marriage. And this is a great point that the Lord just revealed to me as we were going through this. As I said earlier, that our relationship with our spouse reflects Christ and the church. Now, I can't say that Jesus uh, was married because we know that he was not married. And so not being married, he was not divorced. So I can't use him as an example of that. But I can use him as an example of this because Jesus was separated. And the word divorce means separating yourself from somebody. And Jesus was separated from the Father. We know that. So he understands separation. He understands the choices that we have made and the repercussions of that when separation happens in our families and in our relationships. John Calvin wrote a great commentary on this. This is what he said. You have heard his scream. Every time you read the Gospels, you hear his scream, especially Matthew and Mark. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus laid on that cross 
And he screamed out when sin was poured upon him. My God, my God. He's speaking to his father. Why have you forsaken me? Jesus suffered social abandonment from all of the world who abandoned him and emotional uh, desertion from the Father, from the Father himself who deserted him when sin fell upon him. Yet it means more than we can ever understand what Jesus went through. I think this could be the very reason why God hates divorce. I can see that. Because he understands the emotional stress that it brings in relationships and the lasting effects that it causes upon people. And I think that Jesus understood when he was separated from the Father who he had this relationship with for all eternity, and all of a sudden, nothing? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This spiritual des uh, desertion and spiritual wrath from the Father occurred deep down in the very Godhead itself because the wrath of God was also poured on Jesus. We don't think about that. That wrath came on Jesus also. That was the wrath that should have come on us because we were the sinners. Sometimes uh, something was torn in the very fabric of their relationship between the Father and Son. I don't know what that is. I can't surmise, and it would just be surmised. And it would be less than, than what it really is. But something so great, so horrific happened when Jesus and the Father were separated that it is so profound for us to even think about. Yet, we must remember that the relationship with the Father and the Son had been one from eternity. If you can only imagine that. Having a relationship from eternity and all of a sudden, it's gone. It's severed. John 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. That's becoming one. That's being one. And for all eternity, Jesus lived with the Father. The Greek word here, pros, which translated with, with God, can be seen as to or towards God. So what it's saying, in other words, that Jesus and God had turned face to face in a fellowship that was deep with one another. That's all the Lord Jesus had ever known was that relationship, a loving, approving, shining face of the Father in His ever presence. And the Son of God was cut off socially from everyone, deserted emotionally on the cross, and separated spiritually from the eternal Father with whom He had always lived face to face. That's horror. That's horror in his case. And that's the horror that really awaited everyone who died in their sin. That's what hell is about. Hell is about being separated from God for eternity. That's right. That's what's coming upon the world. And that is what happened. That is what Jesus chose to go through because he thought of you and I. He loved us enough to go through that horrific thing of being separated from the Father, which he never experienced in all of eternity, because he loved us so much that he did not want us to experience that abandonment from the Father. So even God, man, cried out unto the Father in heaven, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, we'll never cry those words out, those that are believers. We'll never cry out, Lord, why have you forsaken me? We will cry, thank you, Lord Jesus, for the work that you have done on the cross. It's what he's done for us, for you and I. He has given all for us so that we could have eternal life. So marriage is more than just a relationship between a man and a woman, guys. Let's understand that. Let's embrace that. And let's cherish that relationship with one another. Now, and I know that I'm speaking to a big crowd. Well, okay, not such a big crowd. There's some outside too, so a bigger crowd. And I know that there's some here that have probably been through divorce. I know there's some here thinking of separation. I know that there's some here that are dealing with these kind of issues. And I want you to understand and know that there's always forgiveness and grace with God. Hallelujah. And again, He'll never leave you or forsake you. And so realize that He has forgiven you. 
he wants to give you peace in your life. Let's pray. Gracious Father, I just want to pray right now for those, Lord God, who, who might be realizing, Lord, that their walk with you is not as close as they thought. And they just need to get closer. Maybe they don't know you, or maybe they do know you, and they just need to get closer, Lord. And I'm speaking to those right now, Lord. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ into your heart, and now that you've heard the truth of what hell is going to bring, separation from God for eternity, maybe now is the time to give your life to Jesus. And Jesus has made it clear through the Apostle Paul that if we just confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. If we confess that Jesus' work was enough, that he resurrected from the dead, the Bible says we'll be saved. And so, Lord, I pray for that person right now to simply pray this prayer. Lord, I believe that I'm a sinner. I have failed you in many ways. But I also believe that you can forgive me. That the work of Jesus on the cross was good enough for all eternity. And that he loves me so much that he put himself willfully through these things. Even though he didn't want to. Because he was there in the garden, Lord. And he said, Lord, if this cup can pass somehow. But his obedience was greater. And so, Lord, save me. Fill me with your spirit. Give me new life. Cause me to be born from above, Lord God. And if you're desiring to draw closer to God, let me pray for you. Father, may you minister to the hearts of those that know that they're struggling right now in their relationships. I pray for them, Lord. Strengthen them. I pray that they will see, Father, the importance of their relationship. I pray for forgiveness and for grace, Father, in their relationship. And that you would bring restoration to this relationship, Father. And Lord, this will overflow to their children, Father. And Lord, you would bring peace, finally, Lord, in this family. And we pray these things, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's stand for this last song. God bless you. Remember, check out the sign-up table out there. Stick around for some fellowship, and I'll see you out there. God bless you.